would have been pointless bloodshed. General Orders Number 9, it is what I would consider to be one of the most important lost cause documents of the war. Edward Pollard gets a fair amount of credit, probably too much credit, for popularizing the lost cause idea. It's crucial to, to or I, I think it's important to remember that Southern women played a vital role in uh, advancing the lost cause ideas, and they did that through commemorative uh, uh, activities, especially when it came to the reburial of Confederate dead. And many Southern women claim that this act, this reinterment of Confederate dead, creating uh, cemeteries just for them, that that was an apolitical act. Because they said, we're women. We can't be political. That's impossible. But of course, what they did was intensely political. And so more than Pollard, actually, we should give credit to those Southern women in those first years after the war, 1865 to 1867, the Ladies Memorial Association in particular, they did good work in advancing that lost cause message. Carrie Janey, who's going to be speaking to us this week, uh, she wrote a book on the Ladies Memorial Association. Uh, it's a book that's worth checking out, and I believe it's a book that's back in our library. All right. So, the popularization of the lost cause in the, in the immediate post war years, and again, all this should strike you as sort of odd that I keep saying lost cause. Why in the world did defeated Confederates employ this language? Lost cause, lost cause. It makes, in fact, no sense. Because it's a really strange way of saying that we have been subjugated. It's an, almost an acknowledgment of it. But I would say that the use of the lost cause was a foil. Lost, but not really lost. Defeated, but not dishonored. And so the language of, loss, of, of the lost cause, it in fact <coughs> helps Southerners deal with the burden of defeat. You're going to see my ineptitude of technology for the whole world of C-SPAN to see. So here we go. We'll to get through this out. The second one comes before the first one. <laughs> and you'll get some more opportunities to laugh at this. So, we have to ask ourselves, why was the lost cause necessary? Why the lost cause was necessary? I believe you should turn to the great Southern historian, Z. Van Woodward. And I, I see all of you out there, and I'm not trying to shame my CWI audience. But move your hands for me right now. I do this with my students when they have their pens out there, and I'm saying, "Look, when I am, you know, suggest that this is something you should write down, even if you're really not doing it, just go through the motions." So I'd like to see everyone move their hands right now and write down C. Van Woodward. C. Van Woodward. C. Van Woodward is a must. He's a brilliant uh, historian of the South, and in among his many writings, he wrote about the burden of Southern history. And in the burden of Southern history. He identified the exceptionalism of that history for white Southerners. And for white Southerners, they had the burden of, or I should say the guilt of, holding slaves. They had the burden of secession. They had the burden of a war that sacrificed so many lives. And they had the burden of military occupation. They had to explain, not just to themselves, but they had to explain to the entire world, and that is crucial. It's something that I don't think we've heard a lot of around here, and that is reconstruction is something that should not be studied in isolation. This is just not a regional issue. This is an issue that needs to be globalized. And so white Southerners in the post-war period, they were speaking to the world. They were speaking to a world in which they very much wanted to have membership of, a world in which had moved away from slavery. And now they had gone to their death as a nation and as a people to defend an institution that most of the world, of course, had turned its back upon. And so ultimately, why they turned to the lost cause in this explanation is that they had to make a lost this life. They had to make it sacred. Had to make it sacred. And once again, I impress upon all of you, as deplorable as many of these ideas are, as ahistorical as many of them are, we need to position ourselves 
from the perspective of those former Confederates. Imagine that bloodletting that that nation endured. And now coming out of that, knowing that who's going to write the history of this war? It's going to be the pictures, of course. With that said, we start to work our way through our outline. I'll turn it over as a uh, as a moderator. I, I think I took too much time there, but I, I certainly I'll give my other panelists here an opportunity to speak. We'll have some give and take here as we work our way through this, and uh, then, like I said, we'll get back and have questions for you all. So, the first question: What's the place of slavery in the old South? talk about with my students is that figure that's thrown out where one quarter um, of the white population in the Old South was slave holding by the eve of the Civil War does not mean that the rest of the three quarters of the population was not invested um, completely um, in slavery. Um, for instance, those who wanted to uh, move up economically in society would aspire to slave owning because most of the wealth of Southerners before the Civil War was held in slaves or in land, especially cotton land. And in addition, uh, I would speak to the idea of slave rebellion. Um, whites in the South and the North feared, lived in fear of a reversal of the social order um, in which blacks were subjugated. And the specter of slave rebellion was something that every Southerner feared. Um, so in my current home state of Virginia, um, those of you I'm sure in the audience know about Nat Turner's rebellion. Um, in, the, in the period of the 1830s, Nat Turner, a slave, had hacked women and children in their beds at night um, to death. So there was this idea that even if you were not a slave owner yourself, um, if suddenly the enslaved population rose up and there was a reversal and they perpetrated to whites what was being done to them um, in the brutal institution of slavery, this meant that possible violence could be done. So all of that to say everyone was invested in the social order of subjugating blacks and slavery in the South. Uh, one of the people who really popularized some of the main tenets of the Lost Cause was an ex-Confederate general named John B. Gordon. We'll be talking more about him in a few minutes. Um, and in 1903, just a few months before his death, Gordon's uh, Reminiscences was published. And his depiction of slavery in there, uh, which only takes up a very small portion of the book, it's mainly, it mainly recounts his war um, uh, career. Uh, but uh, the, the portrayal of slavery that he uh, gives the reader is very typical of what you see in countless uh, Lost Cause books. Slaves are devoted and loyal to their masters. Uh, the white and black races in the South know each other and understand each other. And it's only during Reconstruction when Northerners come down to manipulate and, uh, and take advantage of that. Of, uh, uh, free people that, that, that problems arise. Uh, Gordon also points to how slavery had existed uh, in almost every state at the time the Constitution was ratified uh, and that its disappearance in the North uh, occurred not because of anti-slavery sentiment. And again, let me stress this is what Gordon is saying. This is part of this lost cause of mythology. Uh, he claims that uh, the end of slavery in the Northern states came about not because of uh, being perceived as immoral, it had more to do with industrialization and a climate that wouldn't allow for plantation slavery. And let me just add one other element to this, and that's relations among whites in the Old South. And we've heard a lot about the power of race and creating uh, a bond that transcended class. There's no doubt about that. I think at, at times we overemphasize that power of race because it sometimes it, it often reduces, especially poor whites, as to almost unthinking historical actors. They understood that the planter had white skin, they had white skin, but the real differences between them, class differences and social differences, 
And so to think that all these men, when it came to the war, they simply lined up and followed the elite class to their death just because they had white skin is a gross oversimplification. And what we really miss is that there was a firm belief, especially again by those who were of the educated and of the elites, that within the South, slavery created a system that protected white workers, not just raised them up, but protected them from an economic system that was brutal and unforgiving to workers across the globe. Again, the global perspective is essential here, especially in the 1840s and the 1850s. All you have to think about is Dickens, England. It's not a merry time, is it? It's a place in which industrialization is ripping the shreds out of the English working class. And we're already seeing, or I should say, Southerners and Northerners were already seeing in the United States that this cherished free labor ideology in which all men rise up by their bootstraps, that wasn't the reality for all white men. And so the intellectual class of the South pointed to the North, they pointed to Europe, and they said, look, they have no protection as workers. When they get too old or they get injured, they get kicked to the curb. But in the South, our laboring class cradle to grave protection. Now, let me be clear, that's a very uh, self-serving, very idealistic, extraordinarily paternalistic view of that system. But it was their view, and you can't just dismiss it out of hand. And with that view was a firm commitment to hierarchy. You've heard a lot about mastery. You believe in mastery, you believe in hierarchy, and you believe that not all men are created equal, regardless of their skin color. So even with the lost cause, that sort of utopian view they have of their society, it is a utopian view in which stratification is absolutely essential for a society to advance in terms of republicanism, Christianity, and progress. Again, the South wants to be part of the world of nations. They want to be recognized as a prosperous and advanced civilization, but they say to the rest of the world, we've got the answer, it's slavery. That is what's going to allow us to avoid all the chaos that was, of course, erupting uh, in England and, and, and in places in the United States. What caused us a war? Uh, to get back to Gordon, I think his reminiscence um, uh, illustrate one of the main tenets of the lost cause. Uh, he said, and, but in some ways he, he, um, uh, he deviates. He starts off in his explanation, this is in his reminiscence of, of why the Civil War took place, by saying uh, that slavery was the immediate fomenting cause of the conflict. Uh, and it's fair to say that if there hadn't been slavery, there wouldn't have been a war. But then he shifts, and by in, in shifting, he gets to this um, point that Confederate leaders made after the war. Uh, Davis uh, and Alexander Stevens in their writings. Uh, and then uh, Gordon says that uh, it's really uh, the heart of the conflict, that's the phrase he uses, uh, rests with different constitutional interpretations of what the uh, relation, power relationship should be between the federal and state governments. And the South Southerners feared uh, an increasingly powerful national government in the 1850s that would restrict the spread of slavery, uh, and that when Southerners acted to protect their interest and seceded, that secession was uh, a constitutional legal action that they were taking. I'll be speaking a little bit more about Jubal Early, who is known as one of the chief architects of um, important lost cause ideas. Um, he has a great quote about um, the cause of the Civil War from his memoir, so I'll read that. He says, during the war, slavery was used as a catchword to arouse the passions of a fanatical mob, and to some extent, the prejudices of the civilized world were excited against us. But, then he goes on to argue, this was not the real cause of the war. War was over, quote, the inestimable right of self-government against the domination of a fanatical faction at the North, and slavery was the mere occasion of the development of the antagonism between the two sections. 
Um, so what I think early illustrates very well here um, is that there was a shift uh, in what leading Confederates were arguing caused the war. Um, if you look at their writings in 1861 versus their writings in 1865, you notice a distinct switch um, from an emphasis on slavery to an emphasis on states' rights or the right of self-government um, as the cause of secession. Um, and there are, of course, numerous documents we can look at to compare these differences, such as the Declarations of Secession in 1861, which all highlight slavery, Alexander Stevens, the Vice President's cornerstone speech, etc. And then you can compare this to even, say, Stevens' post-war writings in 1865, where he completely reverses his position. In like what two volumes? He yes, writes, it takes two uh, volumes. Horrible volume. Yes, I do what he said with the cornerstone of the Confederacy. But uh, that, the cornerstone of the Confederacy speech, again, should reveal to us that it was a very fine line that the slaveholders had to walk to be able to gain the support of yeoman farmers and non-slaveholders. That even in the messages of secession, you see the very, very heated racial language. You see them being very, I think, very clear that there's radical factions against the South, but, when it came to the moment to go to war, that racial rhetoric for the cause of slavery gets downplayed tremendously. And we should also remind ourselves again, I think it is so crucial, I'm drawing heavily here from another famous Southern historian, Eugene Genovese. He said that the yeoman farmers and the non slaveholders he said they were not political marshmallows, they were used, right? They were sponges that could be used by the slaveholding class. And I think that the fact that there was so much desertion in the Confederacy speaks to that. If in fact that these men were so driven by racial ideology that they could not see their own interest, then you have a really hard time explaining all the Confederate dissent that occurred, which then leads us to our next question, which is, how did the Southern Home Front respond to military invasion, according to the Lost Cause? Uh, Gordon talked about uh, the uh, enormous, the self-sacrifice of uh, white women on the southern home front in uh, in sending their men off to war and then enduring uh, enormous hardships and shortages. Uh, he talks about uh, the loyalty of slaves to their masters during the four years of conflict, those at home as well as uh, body servants accompanying their masters off to war. Gordon's really, um, in his reminiscence, talks very much about reunion, and he, uh, he has kind things to say about most Union generals, including uh, Grant for his magnanimity at Appalachia toward, uh, toward Lee's men. Uh, but there are a couple of Union generals that uh, Gordon uh, uh, is not kind to in his writing, and those are Dave Hunter and Phil Sheridan, uh, and that's because of what Gordon witnessed in the Shenandoah Valley in 1864 and the devastation wrought by the armies, uh, the troops under those two men and what Gordon describes as the indescribable suffering of the women and children in, in, the, in the Shenandoah Valley. So Gordon served under Jubal Early right. um, in the Shenandoah Valley. So much of what I would say from Early's perspective um, would be somewhat similar to Gordon, but Jubal Early was not nice to anyone. <laughs> so Jubal Early, um, was disgusted by the invasion um, of the home front. He, um, he deemed what the Union had done atrocities. He was particularly fixated on Hunter um, and what Hunter had perpetrated against the women of the Shenandoah Valley. He has some choice quotes about this. He says, the scenes on Hunter's route from Lynchburg had been truly heartrending. Houses had been burned. Um, and helpless women and children left without shelter. Even the Negro girls have lost their little finery. So there Jubal Early is standing up for the enslaved um, that Hunter had so viciously perpetrated these attacks against. And this is not to make, to make little of this. And the, the devastation to the valley was something that Early was very impassioned by, um, and this motivated his ire during the war and after the war. Um, so his famous you know, orders to burn Chambersburg, um, he wrote in his memoirs that he did not regret that at all because he felt that this was retribution that was deserved um, because of what the Union had done in the valley. Um, so it was definitely an igniting piece emotionally in his lost cause. So I'm curious how the two of you try to teach this to students because there's a tension here that Carrie, you, 
80 that you have we pointed to, and that is, you can't deny the fact that there was a hard war strategy that was waged against the South. Right? You can't deny the fact what's the military age of the South when they use a fourth of their military age population. You can't deny the fact that there was tremendous unity, in, in fact, unity across the lots of factors. Yes. So, so how do you how do you bring this complexity without at the same time reaffirming a lost cause perspective that I think I hope all of us here are somewhat uncomfortable with? How do you teach it? Well, I don't I don't really see um, attention because going back to what you initially started with. Um, we need to understand that the lost cause had a purpose, uh, that it came from a place of authenticity, even if it developed into a myth. Um, Jubal Early is an excellent example of the emotional toll um, that you know war exacts. Um, and in this case, I'm not talking about you know um, what the veterans panel was speaking of earlier. I'm talking about uh, this this anger and rage and the creation of enemies. That's what war does. Um, and this this is what enemies look like. Uh, Jubal Early calls David Hunter. David Hunter's deeds were those of a malignant and cowardly fanatic who is better qualified to make war upon helpless women and children than upon armed soldiers. Early's not just um, he's not just making that up. He feels that that's what he's seen when he marched through the, through the valley. Um, so I think that that we can give the whole truth, and I think in giving the whole truth. Um, it provides the kind of education we need to understand um, why the lost cause exists. And pointing out, again to reiterate something Pete said at the beginning, that the lost cause myth has kernels of reality in it. We looked at General Orders Number 9. The Army of Northern Virginia was outnumbered in all of its major battles, as were the other. What about, and I know the movie hasn't been released yet, the, the Free State of Jones. I don't even know what the title of it is. <laughs> I think that's it. Oh, is that the title? <laughs> 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 Usually Hollywood screws that. Okay. It's going to be off, what's it going to be? 24th of June. 24th of June, yes. June, yes. And so I'm very impressed with, I believe it's the director who did serious, serious reading about it and is very articulate. I don't agree with all of his findings uh, at all, but uh, that's fine. That's why historians have jobs, because we have interpretive differences. We're sort of like lawyers, right? We've got to keep proving our cases, and so I'm fine with this, with this different interpretation. And what I heard from him and from some of the clips, we see a confederacy that's badly divided. Uh, and that, that division uh, results in poor whites and former slaves or runaway slaves coming together as a almost a band of brothers. So I'm curious about but your thoughts but, about okay, right, yes. no, I was going to say, but <clears throat> at the same time, when you uh, you have you also have to ask the question, which scholars often don't, if you focus on guerrillas, disunionist um, resistance on the home front, uh, deserters, how are those people able to operate for so long? And it's because eighty plus percent of the military age population is in the army. Uh, so, if that's the case, what does that say about the loyalty of the majority of people in Jones County? Right, 80% mobilization is just mind-boggling, right? that level of investment. It is, and I agree with you, but then I think what we lose with that statistic is that mobilization, what's behind it. It's not just all... Uh, no, it's conscription and coercion like in addition to a tremendous, amount of, <laughs> tremendous <laughs> amount of force and violence. I mean, I think that what all of this points to is uh, when you start to unpackage the lost cause and you start to get to see these various experiences and all these different stories, they have to be recovered in some way. Catherine Clinton, who had the last comments in our previous session about the return of Confederate soldiers, I thought she said it beautifully about why these stories from the dark side, that they demand and deserve our attention, but just with the lost cause, for anyone to just simply reject it, not to take it seriously, because within that, you can understand and you can appreciate why men and women, during the war and in the immediate aftermath of the war, why it was so easy for them to make this bloodletting, this loss of life, uh, why they thought that it had to be made sacred. And, uh, and to dismiss, that, to, to dismiss that out of hand as historians is problematic. And I think that it's also problematic even today. I think we're far too quick to see any expression of better heritage as an expression of racism or an expression of someone who's just you know, not 
historically well informed. If you're going to ever create a real conversation with people who have different perspectives, the very first step, of course, is just not to dismiss their views out of hand. It's easy to sometimes do that with a lost cause. I mean, Keith and I have worked in national parks and we have engaged a range of visitors who have some really curious views. And I think we learn quickly on to sit there and try to tell them that their understanding as to why the South lost or that slavery wasn't important. Uh, I, I came to see that a frontal attack wasn't going to work with them. But what was going to work with them was to say, you know what, I understand you had ancestors who fought the Confederate side. I understand why you might feel that when I say slavery caused the war that I'm damning your ancestors, but I'm not. And if you say that, you just might get the conversation. Well, I think John Kosky's book on the Confederate battle flag is an excellent example of dealing with this issue in a nuanced um, and kind of change over time sort of way. Yeah, that's a very good point. Right. Why did the Confederacy fail? Well, we've, a, we've answered this question with the first document we looked at up there with uh, the General Orders Number Nine, and uh, and Jubal Early said that uh, Lee's army had been gradually worn down by the combination of numbers, steam power, railroad. So he's combining the North's industrial might as a cause for the Confederate defeat with the uh, overwhelming numbers of soldiers in the Union armies. And there's little acknowledgement in most of the Lost Cause writing that uh, Union victory came about because of superior generalship on the part of North Northern uh, officers. So can you all help me here with Gettysburg then? Because in the Lost Cause, and in Gettysburg is pivotal in trying to uh, explain the way the Confederate seat. So we talk a little bit about Gettysburg and how it's place in this, uh, this theory of I can, I'll start a little bit and then I'll turn it over. Sure, should we go, should we? To, to keep, so pictures. Keith can actually give a tour on this, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can give a little well, well, preview. Um, but what I would say about that is, um, again, Jubal Early was one of the leading figures who was damning um, James Longstreet. Um, and I, I have a choice quote here from him again, because he's a very quotable fellow. I am firmly convinced that if General Lee's plans had been carried out in the spirit in which they were conceived, and there he's talking about on the second day of Gettysburg, a decisive victory would have been obtained, which perhaps would have secured our independence. So again, this is um, a post-war construction, and indeed the focus on Longstreet is really um, in the 1870s, um, after James Longstreet had publicly made statements about Robert E. Lee that... Um, and after Robert E. Lee's death. And after Robert E. Lee's death, good point. Um, and Jubal Early, one of his chief projects was to um, idolize Robert E. Lee and protect his image. Um, so that angered him and um, you know helped to uh, kind of shift, shift the focus to Longstreet. But in addition, as many of you know, Longstreet had um, committed apostasy by becoming a Republican. He was his own worst enemy. Right. Tripped over himself right. all the time. Right. right, which was just another reason to attack him. Um, so it's really in the 1870s that this shift um, goes to, well, maybe Gettysburg was the moment, um, and maybe James Longstreet was the reason, and A.P. Hill and, and Dick Ewell come into it under fire as well. So you can jump in here. So tell us about Lee here and just how the lost cause, how it iterates with What's the message? Uh, I think the first thing we should point out is that it's not solely a lost cause construction of the veneration of Lee. I mean, there's staggering amounts of evidence from the war that, that Lee's victories in the first two years of the conflict had an enormous impact on Confederate morale. Uh, and, uh, and so that that's a point I would bring up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, early and many other um, ex-Confederate generals um, made it their project to venerate Lee. Um, for early, I think it was personal because when he had faced defeat in the Shenandoah Valley in 1864, Lee had had to remove him from command, but did so very gently and kindly um, in a letter saying, you know, the, the public has lost faith in you, but I haven't. Um, you've done a great job for the Confederacy. And then after the war, before Lee's death, um, Lee and Early exchanged numerous letters um, that I think Early treasured. Um, you know, this Lee was so important to him. Um, and in those letters, Lee said, 
Let's put the emphasis on man-powered material to show the world the real reason we lost. Um, so this became a pet project between the two of them. Um, and I think you know, this kind of melded and, and early put a lot of effort into um, venerating Lee. Yeah, and Lee, the, just to, to clarify, Lee was writing early and Gordon and quite a few other generals in the years immediately after Appomattox to try and obtain uh, copies of their reports and, and Lee was also particularly interested in getting strength figures to help bolster the argument that his army had always been grossly outnumbered by the Army of the Potomac. Which is an important point about Lee. He was working behind the scenes and just think he had been working behind the scenes if he had in fact gone public, which maybe he would have in, public in, what in his perspective and his views. If he had he written his memoir like right. he intended to do. I mean, he passed his veterans away. were urging him. To yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you know, obviously we all know when you go public and you engage in that kind of debate, uh, no one ever looks good. Uh, and so in a way, Lee standing behind the scenes and then dying in 1870, to a degree that preserved his reputation. And I think that this so he's also extraordinarily busy as a president of a struggling college. That's one of the big factors that kept preventing him with the interesting health from, from writing the book. Of course, but he also thought entering that frame right. was distasteful. Yeah. I mean, he just didn't want, he didn't want to engage in that kind of thing. As you know, he never wanted to return to the battlefields. But again, here's where the lost cause comes in. It appears that he is just above the frame, but he was engaging in correspondence behind the scenes. He made it very clear that the wrong side had won this war. He was very dissatisfied with the Republican rule. He was no friend of black folks. Before, during or after the war, of course, the lost cause. It, it's, it, it's able to smooth all those edges and uh, over. But I think the key point, though, is an important one for, to, to remind ourselves of that he was, during the war, already the idol of his people. But then after the war, he became a quintessential Christian general and, and the great general. And here again, it's a, it's a tough thing to teach to your students. Because did he not carry himself that way? Now some will say, my God, how can a professor of history say that when our elite was the slave holder? Again, that would be missing the point here. The point is, is that how he carried himself out the time, how he was perceived by not just Confederates, by, but by many Northerners as well. Uh, they elevated at a, at a, at a point that it was, it was, he was Christ-like. And so that's why Gettysburg, again, is so crucial here, because Gettysburg, you have to find scapegoats. Because Ari Lee has a military record with one asterisk on it, and it's, it's Gettysburg, right? And so now Early makes a hell of a lot of sense, as does William Nelson Pendleton, among others, as to why they have to destroy not just Longstreet's reputation, but others. Because they have to show the world that they weren't out general. Because, of course, this also means what? The war doesn't exist. Beyond the Appalachia Mountains, does it? It exists only in Virginia. If it only exists in Virginia, then you can focus on Lee as the great general who was never out general, who was simply warned out by superior numbers. Oh, but wait a minute, we have Gettysburg, and with Gettysburg we have the great turning point in the war, and God, if only James Longstreet, or Richard Buell, or Jeb Stuart, or <coughs> name others, had only done what Lee wanted, things would have been different. And that part, part of the lost cause, it's still very much with us. Keith and I are going to talk about this on Monday, and all of you, of course, will be on the tour. But to me, what's striking is that Longstreet's reputation has been redeemed, hasn't it? Through Killer Angels, through the movie, and through very good scholarship. There's more balance with Longstreet. But what's still extraordinarily troubling to me is that there still is a lost cause hold on this whole subject, because now people will speak about James Longstreet and say, God, if he... Lee had only listened to Longstreet. <laughs> they only had done that. He had only disengaged and, and, and taken a defensive position and let the Yankees hurl their legions against Lee's army. Things would have been different. They would have won a great battle in Pennsylvania and then marched on to Washington, D.C. And when I hear that hallucination, I want to interrupt folks and say, do you know what you're saying? And we do this far too often, I think, as Civil War students. We depoliticize these what ifs of the Civil War, because what you're saying is that you want Confederate victory, which means you want two separate nations, and ultimately you want one of those nations committed to slavery. So just stop the what ifs in imagining, especially Richard Ewell, that drives me down.
which are covered in early in short form. And uh, let's do the last question. What is the legacy of the lost cause? What is the legacy of the lost cause? And this is a complex question. We could spend a couple of hours just grappling with this. I'll take, I'll make one point here. I mean, in terms of physical reminders, uh, where I'm from, every county seat, uh, every courthouse square uh, has a Confederate monument. Uh, and most of these were erected within a narrow time frame, the 1890s up through 19 teens. Uh, and they were erected for multiple reasons. They were erected uh, to commemorate the, the staggering loss of life and, and, and that had taken place in those four years. Uh, but they're also reminders to everyone in those communities uh, omnipresent day-to-day -day reminders of who holds the reins of power. Uh, and they're being erected during a time when some pretty terrible things are taking place. Being erected in the 1890s, the beginning of the 20th century, when you have the imposition of disfranchisement after Americans being stripped of the vote, you have Jim Crow laws being passed that enact legalized segregation, and you have lynchings. So those monuments today are problematic, as we know. If you follow headlines, particularly since the horrific incidents in Charleston, these monuments are becoming contested more so than they have in the recent past. So I'm going to ask you, so hey, what do you think? How, how do you teach? You know, she, lives in, she teaches at BCU in Richmond. There's Monument Avenue, a monument that has, see, Jackson, Lee, Stewart, uh, uh, Mari, and and Arthur Ash. Uh, so, I'm 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 yes. All of one big major thoroughfare. So uh, I'm sure this issue comes up with your students. How do you handle it? Well, I mean, I teach a, a mixed population, a diverse population of students because um, BCU is an urban campus. Um, so I have students who come up to me in class and say that their families have a picture of Jesus on their fridge next to a picture of Robert E. Lee. Um, I teach a large number of um, students of various ethnicities and races and um, genders. Like I said, it's a very mixed group. Um, so there are mixed ideas. I think about um, what they believe should be done with monuments. And so, I mean, I honor that, frankly. I don't tell them that I have the right answer. Um, but rather that we have to have conversations as communities and I, uh, I'm heartened that we are having conversations as communities because as we know the lost cause um, interpretation has, um, you know, it's, it started in the south, it spread through popular culture to the whole country um, in the 20th century and when we compare the centennial to the sesquicentennial celebrations we see that um, you know, we see an emphasis on emancipation coming back that had been um, obscured for so long. Um, so I think it's very healthy that we have conversations. Um, what I tell my students is the job of historians is to provide context um, for the monuments so that we know that they are Jim Crow era artifacts. Um, and I think he did a beautiful job of explaining that there are many motivations um, behind putting these monuments up. Um, the, the idea of honoring the dead, the fallen, et cetera, in addition to honoring um, white superiority over blacks, right? So these are all um, ideas that are encompassed in these statues. And when they just stand out there by themselves, people may not know the story, or they may only know parts of the story. Um, so finding ways to provide context, if possible, um, is extremely useful. Uh, Jill Titus is on the staff here. She's working on an interpretive marker for the South Carolina Monument here at Gettysburg. And what she is doing, and I know there are other communities who are doing this, even in Georgia, is to put up interpretive markers next to these monuments that would Old provide to all this is doing that, just to provide that context. Because, and first of all, I mean, for those who want to remove the monuments or take them off the cemeteries or just destroy them, that makes utterly no sense to me because it seems to me that. If you want people to appreciate and to understand what Union armies accomplished, not just, of course, Union victory, but also emancipation, we have to encounter, we have to contend with what they were up against. 
And we also have to, as Keith pointed out so nicely, that these monuments, they say much more about the age of Jim Crow than they do about the Civil War. And it's horrifying to me to think that many of these individuals just want to wipe the slate clean when, in fact, if we had other interpreting markers there, that people could have to read so that they could understand and appreciate why these monuments were unveiled, I think that that would do a great deal in trying to understand and make history relevant, which everyone is crying out for. I think there is a way of doing it. And above all else, I hope we can all agree upon this. I want to preserve my right to be offended. I mean, it's, I want my right to be offended to be preserved. <laughs> and I, I am offended. I am offended by many of those Confederate monuments. But I know that taking off that commemorative landscape is just an absolutely grave mistake. And so if you get an opportunity, Jill has done some wonderful work. At some point, we need to get her to lead a tour of the battlefields as they relate to the centennial of the 1960s. I'll end with this, and then we'll turn to questions. Katie had mentioned the 150th. And uh, I will, I think we all should be um, extraordinarily proud and feel great. Great this gratification about where we've come in a very short period of time. Again, to go back to what Catherine Clinton said about all these voices. I think uh, all those voices are coming up to the surface now. They're all being discussed. We are really engaging history in a way that you did not see in the centennial. And what we've done here and what others have done throughout this 150th anniversary is truly remarkable. Truly remarkable. All right. We have some questions from the audience, I believe, that are going to be read to us. So there's some to the left. Did Southern religious traditions and rhetoric have an effect on the South's ability to accept contradictory elements of the lost cause? <laughs> Their ability to accept. I mean, that, that's a really excellent question. I would say that the religious and cultural context um, certainly shaped uh, the manner in which the lost cause was framed by various people. Um, for instance, one of the major reasons um, that the lost cause was developed was that people had to come to terms with the fact that um, they had lost and they thought that they were morally correct and God was on their side. Um, so they had to cope with those, those seemingly con contrary ideas. Um, so I think they continue to justify and fixate on elements that they could say were morally correct, um, and some of those were in contradiction with each other. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just quickly add, I think you're, you're spot on. You know, it's the idea that going into the war, they thought God was on their side just as the Northerners did. And at the end, and again, this is a great shock, but did did former Confederates, did they uh, lose their faith in God? Did they lose their Christianity? They didn't. And again, our previous panel, which I thought was very good, I mean, these were some things that I thought needed to be discussed. And these men, uh, even though the trauma of war and of defeat, nonetheless, they had things that they could hang to in a very meaningful and powerful way. Religion was one of them because they told themselves, we lost, but we're not defeated. And God will, in fact, will vindicate us. It'll happen. <laughs> and they thought, hopefully in their lifetimes, right? But that they truly did believe in that. And then the next point, quickly, would be is that the lost cause in itself became a religion. And that's, we've done any reading about it, it's very, very clear. A great book on the lost cause, I think a starter, a primer, would be Gaines Foster, Ghost of the Confederacy. Gaines, I think that's a good starting point. Wilson's uh, Baptized in Blood is a book that looks specifically at the topic that, that the person asked about, the relationship between Protestant evangelical Christianity and false calls. Oh, I'm sorry, Ashley. Yes, go ahead. Um, did the lost cause rationalization gain international traction in England and France? <laughs> <laughs> and this is, it's so anecdotal that I shouldn't even repeat it, but I'll just say when we worked at the park, I never met a Brit who wasn't, I, I a zealot for the Confederacy. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I just be some international incident now that I've said this. <laughs> they have got to worry about the EU now, so they're not going to be very careful about this. I mean, there was a lot of pro-Confederate sentiment during the Civil War, particularly in England. Class is an important factor there, particularly among the other classes. 
Yeah, I, think, I, I, I agree. I, but I think part of it even why it resonates with the Northerners and Southerners today, why it resonates with the Brits and with the Germans, there is something romantic about the Confederacy. And of course, I will come clean here. I probably should, especially on national TV. But I was a, I was a Confederate reenactor when I was a boy. I was born in Indiana. My mom claims that I was a Confederate reenactor because it was cheaper to get an outfit. <laughs> but I'll just say this: of course, I knew that slavery was a you know a moral wrong. I knew that slavery was a cause of the war. But there was just again something that it, it was. Just not use the word again. There's a romantic appeal to the Confederacy. I suspect that, that explains a lot about why our friends in England and in Germany are infatuated with the Confederacy. How does an examination of the lost cause inform a critical examination of our national myths, such as E. Flora Basurdo? Take it away. You said you'd take the hard ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I said. I said, no, I said, I said, I said, I could take the hard ones that I asked. Yeah. Someone rewind the tape. Uh, <laughs> can you repeat the question? <laughs> we actually need a lifeline, is what we need. <laughs> Jim Martin, are you in the audience? <laughs> go ahead, ask it. Go ahead. How does an examination of the lost cause of Southern myth? And for a critical examination of our national myths, such as E. Pluribus Unum. How does it inform our national myths? I think by the early 20th century, the lost cause myth becomes a national myth, yes. and Lee becomes an icon alongside Abraham Lincoln. I mean, you can look in John Brown Gordon's memoirs and see that. He has very positive things to say about uh, Abraham Lincoln alongside. Yeah, this is a really good question. It's an excellent response. And it needs to remind us of how malleable the lost cause is right. over time. It's always changing how it can, uh, again, bring lots of contradictory elements I mean, together. The, the mantra of heritage and not hate. hate. That's not something that ex Confederates ever said. That's not something you would have heard in the mid 20th century. That's a very recent cat um, mantra that, that to me suggests that people are on the defensive. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry, that was a real quick but I about, the, about the Daughters of the Confederacy. Daughters of the Confederacy in the early 20th century, this is when the national reunification comes about, the lost cause has been sort of submerged in that. So the Daughters are holding contests about writing about the glories of the Old South, and R.E. Lee, and at the same time they're spewing their racial hatred and they are supporting behind U.S. militarism abroad. Right. So you see all of those, what you would think are uh, you know, contradictory elements, they're able to come together and get Talking about the evolution of the lost cause, Harry Scott is that something you heard in the 1920s, that's what, the last 20, 30 years? I tried looking at this and then couldn't find the origin of the term, but I know it's very, very recent. And, and, and a reminder too that here again, the lost cause from the beginning, from those, the latest memorial associations in 1866 and 1867, saying what? We're not political. We're not political. Of course they were political. Harry is not that hate to be. They get it's deeply political. Right. Deeply political. And the anti-federal government deeply trained in the lost cause. Right. Yeah, it's malleable. Uh, if Woodward's birth of Southern history places the guilt of slavery, secession, and the death of 750,000 young men of Southern society, why is the Confederate battle flag, the most recognized symbol of Southern history and ideology, celebrated instead of being associated with that guilt? I mean, again, I, I call our attention to John Kosky, an excellent book on the topic. And what Kosky argues very convincingly is that the flag took on different meanings at different times to different people, and it was used, and it was a malleable symbol. Um, so one person can hold the Confederate flag and say it's simply heritage, not hate, right, hearkening to their ancestors and saying, I'm remembering my lineage, I'm remembering my family. Um, another person can hold the flag and say, to me, it's, in, you know, it's about uh, federalism, and I um, you know, think that the federal government should have a light hand and the state should have a heavier hand. And, and, and during, I'm saying during the Civil War, to speak to the Confederate flag issue, obviously the flag begins as a symbol of the nation. 
take that flag in one battle, and you have men that die under that flag, and men who are from that same community, and now that blood, that flag is drenched in blood. It becomes a sacred emblem. It takes on a different meaning. Again, helping us, I hope, to complicate why the Confederacy, under incredible against incredible laws, maintain an impressive class cohesion for much of the war. There's lots of explanations. The, the Confederate flag itself becomes a sacred object, and because it was an object on the battlefield. I think we have time for one more question. Actually, go ahead. This is a combination of two different questions concerning uh, rape in the Civil War. Uh, how does the lost cause respond to the rape of former slaves by Confederate troops? And conversely, how does it handle the issue of rape against Southern women by Union soldiers? The most writings are silent on that topic. At least memoirs, um, certainly public talks. I, I've looked at a lot of cases where men on the Union side, the court martial doesn't uh, exist for the Confederate side, Union soldiers who were uh, convicted of rape. And, um, and in one instance in 1864, Marcel Patrick, who was a provost marshal in the Army of the Potomac, he was uh, so concerned about the propaganda that the Confederates were using against the North that African American soldiers had been let loose, and they, of course, were raping white women that he wanted to make a point after a black soldier had been convicted of raping, or possibly raping, committing sexual violence against a white woman. He went to such great lengths that he had the soldier's name was William Johnson. He had Johnson scouting in place on the trenches at Petersburg in full view of the Confederate lines. Of course, the Confederates didn't know what they were doing. The Confederates thought that the Yankees were hanging a spy, so they shelled the area. A few, few white Union soldiers were killed, White flag went up, they explained to the Confederates that in fact this was a black soldier convicted of rape. Patrick, he choreographed this to the very end. He brought in two photographers. If you go to William Frasenito's book, Grant and Lee Frasenito, who's a graduate here at Gettysburg College, it's a fantastic book. Those photographs were taken of Johnson hanging from the scaffolding. Uh, and then that image was made into a, what it would call, what you would call for Harper's Weekly. So and it's a huge picture. So it was in the public discourse. They were hiding it, but one more final point about this, it completely backfired for Patrick. Because what he discovered is, one, I've looked at this very, very uh, intensely. There's only one small article about this in the Confederate papers. I thought the Confederates would play this up every day. They didn't do it. Some slaves who ran away from the Confederate lines, they came to Patrick and they said that when they had Johnson on the scaffold that the Confederates pointed across the lines and they said to the to the black slaves of laborers, this is what the Yankees do to slaves. This is what they do to African Americans. And so Patrick's attempt to try to send a message that would infiltrate the, the, the public discourse of the Confederacy, it, it didn't work at all. So there was some discussion of it. Does it emerge in the lost cause? Birth of the nation. Birth of yeah, I don't know why I didn't so think of that. One of the two most important films ever made to propagate the lost cause. Enormously important film. Uh, there are scenes of attempted rape there, but in, in the case of Birth of a Nation, it's it's the black beast rapist the, it, uh, who is um, endangering the purity of a, a virginal white uh, South Carolina. So you, that's probably your best example. And there's also a comic of Yeah. There, she's attacked. Yeah. She shoots the Yankee on the staircase. The staircase, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Scarlet Chair? Yeah, Scarlet Chair. Yeah, sure. Shoots him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.